the International Speech Contest. Before we do that, a couple quick things, a couple housekeeping pieces. I'd like to ask Tim to make a quick announcement regarding the videography, please. Tim Bolden. These proceed okay, these proceedings will be videotaped for posterity's sake. After all the division <laughs> contests are ran, I will make all these contests public. For those of you who are participating now, these contests will be ready probably by late this afternoon. You can email your area governor for the links. They will be up and be made non-public. I will also be sending all the contestants some release forms. Please return them and sign them back to me. Take it away, Linda. During the break, please ensure that it is on silent or better yet, turn it off. Once the contest has begun, the sergeant at arms will secure the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contestants' presentations. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it is determined that all ballots have been collected. At this time, please check your devices to ensure they are off or on silent. I will now give you the speaking order of the International Speech Contest. Please make note. Contestant number one, Jerry Evans. Contestant number two, Diane Bolet. Contestant number three, Martina Matisse. Contestant number four, Capital Mystery. And contestant number five, Nick Valentuono. Does anyone need me to repeat the speaking order? Okay, we're going to proceed with the International Speech Contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light or green card when one minute is up. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete the ballots. We'll now be taking the International Speech Contest. Contestant number one, Jerry Evans. Someday Dreams. Someday Dreams, Jerry Evans. Dreams and desires, 
but never taking a single step to actually achieve them. For years, I dreamt about leaving my corporate job to start my own business. Without ever taking a single action, I would visit Sunday Isle and daydream about being my own boss. I became addicted to and hooked on opium. Not to be confused with opium, <laughs> I knew I needed to take the habit, but couldn't seem to just do it. My deepest fear was that I would remain stranded on Sunday Isle without ever attempting to get off. My Sunday Isle wake-up call came right after the New Year in 2005. The universe decided that I needed a swift kick in my assets. I was in my office checking my email when the company's owner knocked on my door. I looked up, saw that he had a check in one hand and a letter in the other hand. He walked in, stood in front of me, looked at me, then dropped the bombshell. I'm sorry, we're letting you go. You have two hours to gather your things and leave. He handed me the check and the letter, turned, and walked out. I was speechless. I couldn't think. I couldn't breathe. I felt utterly lost and had this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach as if someone had just punched me in the gut and knocked the life out of me. Have you ever felt that way? Tears well up in my eyes. And I was about to explode. But in that moment, I realized that I had a choice. I could dwell in pink slip devastation, or I could see this for what it really represents. A bright pink ticket off of Sunday Isle toward my Sunday dreams. With my ticket in hand, a lot of courage, and a big leap of faith, two weeks after leaving, I started that company that I had dreamed of for so long, my company, the awards company. In all honesty, it was not an easy choice. It was hard to do. I had fears and doubts. I thought, I'm not sure I can do this. Am I good enough? I'm scared. What if I fail? What if I let my family down? There were setbacks and challenges along the way. Even times when I wanted to quit and give up. But I told myself, I don't care what happens, and will never ever give up until I make my dream a reality. I want this with all my heart. It's the life I want to live, a life on my terms, and not on the terms of some corporate organization that ultimately doesn't really care about me. The thought of going back to work for someone else, because I might have to, made me feel sick to my stomach. But, I punched my ticket anyway, and I'm happy to say that even though it is now, more than nine years later, I haven't looked back on that Sunday Isle. I don't know what your Sunday Isle is, it's different for everyone, but the end result is always the same. You keep waiting for something else to happen before you gather your courage and go for your dreams. You settle for a life less than you deserve. Dirt settles, dust settles. But ask yourself, what can I do to make my someday dreams come true today? First, think about what you really truly want for your life and chart a course to get there. It could be a major someday I like. Start your own business as I did. Leave an unfulfilling job for a new or a better one. Go back to school or a minor someday I like. Take up a hobby or pick up that instrument you've wanted to play for so long, why someday? Why not today? I believe, with my heart and soul, we all begin our lives on Sunday Island. As we get older, we get caught up in the daily struggles and life gets in the way. We get beaten down by the massive hammer of conflict in our lives. Our dreams are postponed to deny, and we end up on Sunday Island. So ladies and gentlemen, Maybe, just maybe, the time has come to escape, punch your ticket, pack your bags, take your trip off of your Sunday Island.
Set sail for your today I will, and enjoy the journey. Tell yourself, today is the day I start my Sundays. Madam Contest, Toastmasters. Diane Bolesh, tis the season, tis the season, Diane Bolesh.
process that they need to go through is completely in flow right there already. It's in the package, the DNA. And unlike my childhood, where the magic could be purchased at Kmart or Sears or that cuddly Dudley from Toys R Us, this is the real deal. The magic. You can buy the seeds. You can't buy the magic that makes them work. The potential in the power of your hand. My favorite season to consider all they can be. And all they ask is the light of the sun and a splash of rain and abracadabra. The process begins. The process of growing expanding, transforming themselves until the final yield of abundance, the blessing of their DNA. I read recently that each of us has within us the seeds of every human experience and all human potential. You have within you a seed catalog of amazing proportions. So I invite you to get comfy, open that catalog, and consider what have you been growing? Have you planted and propagated peace and joy and wisdom in your world? Have you been cultivating character? kindness and compassion in your communities? Are you tending truth, integrity, and justice in your own life? Oh yes, the crops are available, the seeds are there. <clears throat> but just like the seeds in the garden, these seeds need the light of your consciousness and the energy from your emotion for abracadabra that magic to begin. Everything has a season. And right now, bless the weatherman for today's change. Because we're leaving my favorite season of planting and stepping into my new favorite season, planting. And shortly after that will be my next favorite season of cultivating. Although the cultivating season is a little bit of a challenge. I do prefer the ho 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 of my childhood to the ho 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 <laughs> of heart. But to have the yield, you have to be willing to battle those bugs, those people who bug you. You have to be willing to stand in the sun, the scrutiny of others. You have to be willing to pluck the weeds. Well, actually, those intentions are replanted in your garden by <coughs> people. And all together, be responsible for your own garden. Yes, now is the season. The power, the potential of those seeds lies in the activation. The power of potential is in the right now. Right here, right now. Right here. Right now. Our lives, our lives are our soul's season for growth, for transformation, for abundance. I invite you, right here, right now, choose. Tis the season.
Martina Matisse. Once upon a time. Once upon a time. Martina Matisse. Madam Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, most welcome dignitaries. I'd like to share with you a story from a long, long time ago. There once was a little boy named Matthew. He called his mother, Mommy. He called his father, Daddy. And he called his grandfather, Big Daddy. And Big Daddy loved this little boy so much that magical things started to happen. Every time Matthew got a hug, a tree grew in his backyard. Until his backyard did not look like a typical backyard. His backyard was an immense, dense, tremendous forest of trees. And when he was very little, he wanted to go in and explore. And he would say to Big Daddy, Big Daddy, I want to go in that forest. There's something there for me. And Big Daddy would tell him, Son, there's bears in that forest, and you're going to need to be strong if you're going to go in there. But Big Daddy, I am strong, and I got muscles. Grr. I can growl, too. <laughs> Big Daddy said, well, son, if you want to learn how to be truly strong, I'll teach you if you're willing to listen, to try, and to practice. I'll teach you. And he did. That's what Big Daddy said. That's what Matthew learned. He learned to become so strong, he didn't need to growl anymore. And he got bigger. A little bit bigger. He still wanted to go in. He said, Big Daddy, I'm ready. I want to go in that forest. And Big Daddy said, well, son, there's snakes in that forest. Some of them are poisonous and some of them are not. But you're going to have to learn to be quick. And I'll teach you if you're willing to listen, to learn, and to practice. He said, all right, I will. Matthew became so quick he could see a blade of grass move from 50 yards away. He could see danger. He got a little older still, and he still wanted to go in that forest. He could sit every day, have his lunch, and look, visualize, lay strategy for what he would do when he would go in that forest. One day, he picked up a sandwich. It was gone. A fox had come out of that forest and stole <coughs> his sandwich right up from under his nose. All day, he was hungry. He went to Big Daddy that night and told him what happened. Big Daddy said, son, you need to learn how to outbox a fox. And I can teach you if you're willing to listen, to learn, and to practice. Matthew agreed. He was now smart, and he was quick, and he was strong, and he was ready to go into that forest. He looked back at Big Daddy, he got the nod, and he went in. It was a magical place. And he saw an odd sight. He saw ten trees all in a row, straight trees, perfectly in alignment. In the forest, there's trees, they're leaning, they're straight, they're big, they're small, they're here, they're there. But these were in a row. Why? He took his strength and he shook the tree. And a dime fell out, caught the dime. Next tree he shook, he caught a dime too. All ten trees <coughs> had his hands full of coins. Now Matthew's smart enough to know that when you don't understand, you seek answers. So what did he do? He brought it back to Big Daddy and put it on the desk. Big Daddy smiled and he leaned back in his fine leather chair. He opened the drawer to his beautiful mahogany desk and in the drawer were three jars. <coughs> First one had a gold cross point painted on it. And Big Daddy said, son, put the first coin in here and we're gonna take that with us to church on Sunday. The next jar had a lid on tight. He said, son, you put the second in here, and keep this lid on tight, and you don't open it until you've got more gray hair in your head than I do. <laughs> and this last jar, this is where the rest goes. And that's what you build with and create. That's what Big Daddy said. That's what Matthew learned, because every day he went into that forest, whether he wanted to or not, no matter what his friends were doing, he went into that forest and he explored, and he found his trees. He collected the dimes until the dimes turned to quarters. 
the quarters turn to dollars, or the dollars turn to fives, and the fives into tens, and the tens into twenties. And he worked those jars just like Big Daddy taught him to do until the day came when the trees were gone. They were just gone. There was no scars in the earth. There was no evidence. There was no people. They were just gone. What does he do? He's got to get to Big Daddy. He's big now and he's strong. And he uses that strength and he runs all the way back. He's got to get to Big Daddy. His eyes search the horizon. Where is Big Daddy? Oh, well, Matthew is a grown man now. Big Daddy's gone. His throat gets tight. His hands turn to fists. He squeezes his eyes until he hears Big Daddy's voice. Son, you have lived with discipline and purpose. Don't stop now. Keep looking. Matthew said it out loud. I, I live with discipline and purpose. I live with discipline and purpose. He looked back into the woods and he ran until he couldn't run anymore. And he walked until he couldn't walk anymore. And then he wanted to quit, but he searched. He wouldn't, he didn't, he couldn't quit. He looked and in an obscure place, he found his trees. Only now, they dropped gold. If Matthew were here today, 18T building, he would tell you the same story. He would tell you that what he thought was strength was building strength of character. What he thought was being quick was the ability to be present and aware and focused. What he thought was being smart enough to outfox a fox was the ability to listen and respond. All these lessons he learned from his big daddy. And now, Matthew himself is big daddy. He's got his first grandson. And when he told his grandson this story, the boy said, oh, big daddy, I want a forest like that of my own. And big daddy said, you can, son. You can. Come on over here and give me a hug. Apple mystery. Apple mystery. Superheroes are everything. Superheroes are everything. Apple mystery.
and all the chairs were tall buildings. <laughs> and I was saving all of you <laughs> and the rest of the world from my imaginary nemesis. I loved superheroes. And so one day, I asked my father, Baba, can I be a superhero? Are superheroes real? And his answer blew me away. He said, kiddo, yeah, you can be a superhero. And superheroes are everywhere. He planted the seed of a superhero. In <coughs> but the only thing I was thinking about for the next few weeks was, will Spider-Man and Batman be upset <laughs> if I claim to be Superman? <laughs> See, my father's superhero did not wear a cape or a mask. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi was a thin, scantily clothed man who, with a simple nonviolent philosophy, brought down a kingdom so powerful down to its knees and gave India its freedom. Out here, his superhero would have been Rosa Parks, slight in stature but mighty in courage, who with a single act of defiance triggered a movement that changed America. As I would grow up, my superhero would be Derek Redmond. Now Derek Redmond was running the 800 meters race in the 1992 Olympics. No, he did not come first. In fact, he finished last. He was running the 800 meters and midway he collapsed. He had a torn hamstring and he struggled to get up. The medics rushed to him. They, they wanted to take him away. He was crying, not because of the pain, because he did not finish. He wanted to finish. He limped to the finish line. He wasn't faster than a bullet, but he was unbeaten on courage. <coughs> Slowly, I realized that surpassing human limitations or turning yourself into a flame is a very narrow vision of a superhero. On 9-11, Peter Gansey was the chief firefighter of New York. He was standing under the North Tower along with his men. A message came to him, get out, the, the tower is going to collapse. He refused. During the Boston Marathons last year, you did not hear of police running away from the bus. They were running towards it. Now, my father's words were making more sense to me. If you look, look close enough, there are superheroes everywhere. Your local firefighter does not have a body of steel, but he will not blink before coming to your rescue. Your seventh grade English teacher, she might not have x-ray vision, but she could change the trajectory of her life. I think superheroes can also be close to home. Two of my best friends got married ten years ago. They have a child with a, with, with a special need. I have seen their life. I have been a part of their life. I have seen them struggle. I have seen them making sacrifices. I have seen them change jobs, quit jobs, move schools, go in debt, and even challenge a medical establishment just because they thought that their daughter could do better. They are my superheroes. My father struggled so that I didn't have to. Today I'm here standing in front of you living my someday dream <laughs> because of him. <coughs> Fellow Toastmasters, I think there is a superhero in all of us. He looks like us. He dresses like us. And when the right time arrives, he will rise to the occasion without a cape. A few months ago, 
my son was jumping on the couches. He was Iron Man. And I joined him. Together we were superheroes. We were trying to save you and the rest of the universe from the evil Loki, who my son said was on the kitchen counter. <laughs> familiar question. Baba, are superheroes real? Can I be a superhero? We know the answer to that question. <coughs> you can be a superhero. And superheroes are everywhere. Question is, which one will you be? Please, while the judges complete their ballots. Nick Valentine, the greatest sport in the world. The greatest sport in the world. Nick Valentine. Anything. <laughs> Me, I fumble putting the band over into the remote. 
I'm the artistic one, the creative thinker. I usually have a deeper question instead of a straightforward answer. But transcending itself and maneuvering its way through all of that disconnect, all that difference, all of that stubbornness was always a sport of soccer. When I was a kid, every Sunday my dad and I, we'd gather around the TV and we'd watch the games and we would anticipate the scoring chances and we would agonize if we missed opportunities and then the ref would make a bad call. My dad would spring up in the seat, point to the TV and say, I didn't use a lot of the words my dad used. I would always be around. I learned the hard way that the wrong four-letter word of English or Italian. <laughs> but as I mentioned, I didn't know Italian descent. So when Italy played, it was not a game in my house. It was a festival. The night before, my dad and I talked about how we couldn't sleep. We had too many butterflies in our stomach. And on those big game days, we didn't have dinner, we had these spreads. I mean, the table was a mile long. Big CD, fried calamari, and made focaccia bread. And my dad used to go to Jewel, he used to buy those big jugs of Carl's Rossi wine. <laughs> For 10 bucks, all the adults drank like they thought they were Italian boil. <laughs> but when Italy won a big game, so my father and I did something we didn't normally do. We, we bonded, we were celebrating our heritage, we were taking pride in part of our identity. But of course, soccer's like life, you're not gonna win every game. Italy lost, there was a certain gloom that I felt, and it would kind of linger throughout the house. I remember one time in particular, it was 1990, and Italy hosted and played in the World Cup, which is the greatest soccer tournament in the world. And they lost to Argentina 2-1 in overtime. And we had a lot of people at the house that day, and I looked over at my father, who was suddenly sitting by himself in the corner, and I actually had to do a double take because I saw a tear squeaking out of his right eye. In all seriousness, it's one of the few times in my life I've seen him express intense emotions. And there's a milestone in some of our lives that I often think goes <coughs> unnoticed or unrecognized. It's the moment when you look at your parents and you realize they're not these supernatural beings, they're just regular and normal people. And the irony in that is I've learned in any relationship, when you remove expectations and labels from people, and you see them for who they really are in their raw and genuine form, it's only then can you even ever attempt to understand them and take a, a step closer to them. And in that summer of 1990, I took a step closer to my father and I began a journey of seeing him from a new and brighter perspective. Because here's the reality about fa families, especially fathers and sons who butt heads. Sometimes you just need a rallying point. And for me, for my father, for our relationship, it was always a sport of soccer, which for me will forever make it greatest sport in the world. I'd like to leave here tonight by giving you two questions to think about. Who's a person in your life that you struggle with? Is it a parent? Maybe it's a sibling that you're never on the same page with. Maybe it's a friend that you've fallen away from. Maybe it's that colleague at work or that person on your block. You don't know what it is, but the interactions are just always awkward. And then once you've identified that person, my next question for you is, What's your sap? Let me rephrase. What, what's your rally point? Like me, is it a sport? Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's more common, like food or the weather. Maybe it's art or gardening. Or maybe it goes deep. You've shared good and bad times together. You know, Hollywood is funny. They always make relationships seem warm and fuzzy. And I don't know about you, but I think they're pretty hard sometimes, too. And the song is right. We will get by with the little help from our friends. But here's a secret, you can get by with help from things too. This summer I'm excited because it's another World Cup year, so my dad and I are going to sit down in front of TV and continue the journey together. In fact, all of you are welcome, we'll go ahead and save a seat for you, just two things. Bring your appetite, and most importantly, look out for my mother's wooden spoon. <laughs>
the ballots have all been collected.
She's in corporate America. She works for a career builder, so she helps people find other positions, so which is great. Kevin is real easygoing, relaxed, and my daughter, she's she's like wired up all the time, and she has to really learn how to relax. And if there's, you know, when you have your children, you have one that has really smart, you know, just academically, and so that's my daughter and my son Kevin. He's on the common sense side. He has tremendous horse sense. So the most simple situations, he can figure out my daughter on the end. So, well, let me analyze this, Dad. <laughs> so that's the difference between the
two clubs. I belong to Toastmasters on Purpose, which is an advanced club in Harper College. And today I'm representing Harper College uh, Club 134514. <laughs> 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 I've been a Toastmasters for altogether about seven years. Okay. And the education level? I've uh, finished my CC. I'm about three quarters of the way of finishing uh, my CC again because I've decided to uh, do it again and then I'm about head for my CL. Okay. One of your interests you listed was movies. What's your favorite all time movie? Oh, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. Table topics. <laughs> I think I have to do it by category. Yeah. Uh, my favorite mob movie is Godfather. My favorite mm -hmm. sports movie is. Um, Sandlot, my favorite chip flake is my best friend's wedding. Barbara, for those of you who 
HTML is a saint. Amy already knows this because of how much I interplay with her. But Barbara got to see that the last two weeks. And she has also seen the ups and the challenges of being in this kind of position. And so you got to hear a lot of things where you were like, oh my God, I made it mad. Boy, you, you came through it so long, Barbara. This contest could not have been anything about you. So thank you so much. Please call our Lieutenant Governor of Marketing and our Lieutenant Governor of Education Training to the stage to help me share the awards. And Barbara, would you be so kind and have the honors of sharing with us who won our contest today? Oh. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming today. This is a wonderful audience. Thank you for being so patient with me, because I know it's been a challenge for me and some of the contestants and judges and everything. So I truly thank you, and it has been a big learning experience. So I thank you for that. Now, on to what we're here for, the winners. Hey, we'll start with table topics, and we'll start with our third place winner. And I want to get a drum roll. Star Wars Powell. Our second place winner for two thousand four hundred contest is Paul Lockwood. Second place. 
congratulate our winners for the 2014 <laughs> Thank you.